Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. The first thing I need to tell you is that I am no theologian. <laughs> I am not a pastor. Um, I just love to read the Word of God, and um, I love what He shows me when I read the, the Word of God. Um, my presentations are always just studies that God has done with me, and I pray that um, you will receive something rich out of what He has shared with me. Um, so with that in mind, I'll just ask you to just bow your heads and, and as I pray. Praise the Heavenly Father, Lord. We pray for your spirit. Lord, we pray that um, your presence will be here, that you will teach us, that you will inspire us, that you will help us to see who you are. May you protect us from the evil one, may you encase us, Lord. May you hide me behind the cross, Lord. You know me. I am a person of unclean lips, Lord. May you anoint them. May people hear and see you instead of me. May this hour be spent in close communion with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of things we've been touching on during the school, or the, the group we've been having here during, during the week, has been this Pentagon. It's been called a Pentagon of Lies. How we've been looking at God's character. How, the, how Satan would like us to see God's character. And how would Satan like us to see God's character? As cruel. As cruel. What else? Stern. Stern. Angry. Distant. Angry, distant, vindictive. Everything that he is, he wants us to put on God the Father. The law and the gospels. We've been looking at that. And the lies spoken about them. We've been looking at the nature of Christ and the issue with the Trinity. We'll be looking at the Sabbath sacredness issue and the immortality of the soul. This is what we have come to understand or look at as the Pentagon of Lies. Today I'm, just, I'm going to touch on my experience with this from a purely Catholic background. I understand my understanding of the character of God is totally different to this now. And what has changed me to look at these things? Um, so, give me your best Bible verse. The one that, that grabs you. That grabs you. Your, the one that you, that you read and it inspires you and it takes you to, to your own little hiding place where only you and God are there. We all have them. Well, at least I have them. <laughs> Anybody else have one? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Any other Bible verse? Nobody can cast me out of the Father's hand. Amen. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. The first one I ever learned on my grandfather's knee. God is love. God is love. Um, yeah, I love these and love with loving kindness I've drawn there. Amen. You are my beloved son. Well, who am I more pleased? Yeah. Eagle. Uh, the one today uh, was, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly place. Amen. Amen. Please. I know in whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. Amen. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Amen. Very focused on somebody else, isn't it? All the verses are very focused on somebody else. Not on me. Okay. I want you to open your Bibles. Let's get to John. John chapter 14. I want to share you my... One of my favorite passages. John chapter 14. <coughs> we'll start with one and we'll go to three. Who knows this verse, verses? Does there anybody not know these verses? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a fantastic group of verses. When you read that, what stands out to you? Oh, Jesus is coming back to take me home. Christ is coming. What else stands out to you? There's a lot of room in the Father's house. A lot of room. How's it start? Don't be troubled. What's the premises? You believe in God. What's the invitation? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. This verses shout out invitation. This verses shout out authority. Can, can a son authorize you to go and live in somebody else's house? Has he got the authority to do that? Can I say, okay, Igor can go and live in Igor's place? Will Igor be happy with that? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it depends on the relationship you have. Okay? <laughs> it depends on the authority given to you to do that. This verse shows that Christ has been given the authority to make this statement and he's also been given the authority to give the invitation out by his Father. Can you see that in these verses? These verses are not just verses to be ticked off at a pathfinder realm or a pathfinder group. It's not something to say, I've, le I've learned a verse, this is it. God wants us to take this into our hearts. And he impressed me to take it into my heart. Abel said that this was a promise that Christ was coming soon. This has been known as the blessed hope in Adventism. Correct or not? Mm -hmm. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Does it burn within our hearts still? Hope in the coming of the Lord. Does it still burn within our hearts? To the, to the days of, of the apostles, it was the promise. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, 35. Now, as soon as somebody has it, just say Amen. Amen. Okay, can you start reading, please reading 35, 36, and 37. Hebrews 10, 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. So what's the promise you are to receive? For in a little while, he that, shits, that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Isn't that the promise you are to receive? And what's your part of receiving the promise? Cast not of your confidence. Cast not of your confidence. Be patient. In God's time, He will come. Is that how you read the verse? It's always been an emphasis in the New Testament that Christ is coming. It's an emphasis of Adventism. What, what's the Seventh Adventist Church called? The Seventh Day Adventist Church. What are we waiting on? The second advent. What is the second advent? The coming of the Lord. That is what we're waiting for. This is what the Gospels um, I'm, I'm encouraging. This is the response to John 14. The concept envelops the whole of the Bible. Christ is always coming. When was the first time humanity met Christ? When was the first time humanity met cross? Met God? In? In Eden. How did he meet God in Eden? He opened his eyes and, oh, there's my father. That's how he met him. When man woke, God was there. 
What was the problem? What happened in Eden? What destroyed the relationship in Eden? Lies. Listen to another voice. Listen to another voice. The lies. Sin into the world. And where was God when, when sin into the world? Let's go to Genesis 3. <coughs> chapter 8. Chapter 3 or chapter 8? Chapter 3, verse 8. Thank you. Pass over. <laughs> Somebody read that for me. And they heard the voice of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So in the first shadows of wrongdoing, where was God? Walking in the midst of the garden. What was he doing there? He was looking for... He was looking for for his children. He was looking for Adam and Eve. And what was what was their relationship to God now? They were, they were looking forward to seeing him, weren't they? No. No? Yes. They, they were hid. Why did, why did they hid? They were afraid. They were afraid. Afraid of what? They had a fear that they didn't really understand. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Tell you what, when I did something wrong, I hid from my father. <laughs> And I can see people smiling. Why are you smiling? Because <laughs> you know what's coming up next. <laughs> you know, I hear from my father. What made them think that God would come as a tyrant? Because he was selfish and he was hiding something from them. And <coughs> he wasn't honest with them. He wasn't honest with them. He lied to them. That's what the serpent would have them believe. They change. Their idea of God changed. But God was still there. The first shadows of wrong, He was there. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. God's still coming to man. Why does God keep coming to man? Why doesn't God just let man be and die a natural death? Of him? Why does He keep coming to man? He loves us, his character. The creation is, is precious to the Creator. Mm -hmm. So he comes in the Garden of Eden, and when's the last time he comes again? Revelation 22, verse 20. Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even, even so, come Lord Jesus. What is happening? Why is he coming? Redeem us back to the garden. It's over. We redeem us back to the garden. So we have him coming in Genesis, and we have him coming in Revelations. Is that the only time he comes? No. He constantly come, keeps coming to his people. Why does he keep coming to his people? Because he knows somebody is going to respond. Respond to what? We will explore that. He comes because someone is going to respond. Think of the Bible. Think of every event in the Bible. Think of your heroes in the Bible. Noah, Moses, Methuselah. Think of the villains in the Bible. What villains can you think of the Bible? Amen. Pharaoh? Who else? Amen. 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 Judas. 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 Abel. 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 Abel.
Think of all the little characters in the Bible that we don't even think much of. They're still important to God. Think of every history book you've ever read. You've ever read. What are the history books full of? I don't say history. <laughs> Because history keeps repeating itself. What's the history book looks full of? Is there any real difference between the Napoleonic Wars and the Babylonian Wars? <coughs> Is there any difference? What they used to fight would have been different, but the philosophy is the same. To dominate. More close to home. Think of the newspapers. Think of the TVs. <coughs> think of everything you've read. If you were God, would you come? Or would you just let it go? You're very tempted to let it go. Aren't you? Very tempted yeah. to let it go? Yes, <laughs> And we see these on a superficial plane. God sees these personally. Each individual on this planet that has ever been, God has felt their pain. God has seen their life. God has every right to say, not interested. Not interested. Yet the promise is, I come. I come. Ponder what that means. But despite of everything you see, despite of all the evil on this planet, despite of the evilness in you, God is still saying, I come. I come. He never changes his mind. He comes because somebody's going to respond. Somebody's going to be saved. And he comes. Maybe this is the promise that the early church grabbed onto. That made them want to finish the work as soon as possible. Christ is coming. The blessed hope. He is faithful and true, and He is coming. We need to finish the work. Do we believe He's coming? Amen. Are we finishing the work? I pray that we allow God to finish the work in us. Then you can finish the work. So like I said, this is my study. I've, enjo I, I've enjoyed looking at John... Totally different at the last two years that, I, that I've looked at it previously. Um, the how I read John now is different to the how I used to read John. And as I look at the Gospels, uh, I categorize the Gospels like this. Matthew is the Gospel for the Jews. You know that. Mark is the Gospel of action. Luke is the Gospel of Jesus as a man. But John. John. What is the Gospel of John for me? It's the Gospel of all. It leaves me speechless. As you understand what John is trying to tell us, you are speechless. The definition of all. The best definition I could find. An all overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration and love, of fear, as in respect, produced by that which is grand, sublime, extremely powerful. And the only thing that I compare it to is as if in awe of God. There's nothing else to compare it to. As in the awe of God. As I read John, I can see John being speechless as he writes. He is awestruck at the God that he worships. He is awestruck at the fact that God comes. Let's go to John chapter 1. These are all very well known verses. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Awestruck. How does Matthew start his Gospel? How does Matthew start his Gospel? Genealogy. How does John start his Gospel? Genealogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He goes so much further. He doesn't stop at the Son of Adam. He starts with the Son of God. Be awed. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. How can the world not know him? How can the world not know him? And still he comes. Still he comes. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God came and dwelt among us. What does that mean to you? When you think that He came and dwelt among, that, among us, what does that mean to you? To me, is that He left heaven. The greatest treasure in heaven left heaven to abide with me. That He dwelt among us. That He breathed. That he ate, that he slept, that he smiled, that he cried, that he laughed. God among us, laughing like you, crying like you. And we knew him not. Speechless. Why would he do that? John 3.16 God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. Why would He send His Son? He knows us. He knows what we're capable of. Yet He sends His Son. Why are we not in awe that God sent His Son? The universe looks on, and they are in awe that God sent His Son. The demons look on, and they are in awe that God sent His Son, and they have no answer to it. They are in awe that God would do this. For us, why would He do that? Speechless. John chapter 1, sorry, John chapter 1, he comes to earth. John chapter 2, he comes to a wedding and he becomes married. John chapter 3, he comes to give rebirth. John chapter 4, he comes to give the living water. John chapter 5, he comes to heal. Chapter 6, he comes to feed others. Chapter 7, he comes to reclaim true worship. Chapter 8, he comes to set the captives free. Chapter 9, he comes to open up our eyes. Chapter 10, He comes as a shepherd to protect and ask us to follow Him. He comes. Chapter 11, He comes to re resurrect the dead. Chapter 12, He comes to die on our stead. And chapter 13, what's happening in John chapter 13? Let's go. John chapter 13. What is chapter 13 all about? Humility. Humility is the chapter of the Last Supper. Yes? He's, he is there with his beloved group, having one last meal with them. Who is this group that he's, ha that he's having a meal with? His disciples. How long have they been with him? 
three years plus? Have they seen the events of chapter 1 through to chapter 12? Have they seen him feed the multitudes? Have they seen the sick walk? They have been privy to these things. They are his closest group. And he is having his last meal with them. Let's look at Luke chapter 22. That opens it up a little bit for us. Luke chapter 22. Keep your finger on John 13. Should have said that before you changed. <coughs> and let's start with verse 15. Somebody read that for me. So when you read those that word desire, what does what does that bring into your thoughts patterns? As you read desire, what does that what does that encourage you? What what do you think about? It's important. Really. It's important. What else? It's longing. Longing for it. It's is it intimacy? Desire? <laughs> does he not know what's going on? Does, does Christ not know what's going on in the upper room? I mean, what is going on in, in, in amongst them? Jesus said he desires to eat this meal with them. Does he not know what's going on? Isn't there other more important issues going on in the room than for him to say, I desire to have a meal with you? What's happening in verse 21? Christ tells them that there's a betrayer there. But he desires to have a meal with his betrayer. Does he not? What's happened in verse 23? I want to know who it was. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them that was should do these things. So what, what's, what's happening here? They're making accusations? What type of accusations? It must be you, because it's certainly not going to be me. I, I bet you, you know, you know uh, Peter looks like he, it might be Peter, but, it, but it's def definitely not going to be me. What about him? What about him? I bet you it's him. And Christ is saying, with desire, I want to have this meal. Doesn't he see that something else is happening? What about verse 24? And there was also a strive among them. Which of them should be kept the greatest? So what does it mean when there was a strife amongst them? Discord. Discord? Disagreement. It was a quiet, polite conversation in the corner. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to be better than you. This wasn't a quiet conversation. Okay? As defined, it's strife. Did Christ not know what was going on? Verse 25. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Let's take out the added words as we read verse 26. But ye... Not so. Mm. But he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is the chief, as he that does service. So how's Christ seen his apostles? This is what he's blessing them with. He's giving them a blessing. And what's the blessing? That they will not be like the world. They will be different. So does he know what's actually going on? Does he know what's going on in the room? Yes. Obviously he does. But he's encouraging them to look at things a little bit different. Let's go back to John, chapter 13. And this is to show how Christ really knows their hearts.
He's trying to unify them before he goes. 13 verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved thee, that ye shall also love one another. By this shall all know that ye are my disciples, if you have love to one another. Does he know what's going on? Did they have love towards one another? Was there conflict in the room? Were they showing brotherly love? Or were they showing, trying to find out who was the greatest? Christ knows exactly what's going on. He knows and he sees the, the, the division. He sees the suspicion. He sees the air of superiority. And then he tells them something in verse 36 and 37. He tells them that he is going away. And how does Peter react to the fact that he can't follow Christ? How does Peter react? Simon Peter said unto him, sorry, 36, Lord, where thou goest, Jesus answered him, whether I go, thou cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter says unto him, Lord, why can't I follow now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Peter is saying what? That he will, he will die for Christ. This is the relationship he has with Christ, that he will die for Christ. And everybody in the room is hearing what Peter is saying. I will die for you. I will follow you. Everything you say, I will do. No, that's another verse, isn't it? That goes back. Everything you say, I will do. I will die for you. Peter is showing that his relationship with Christ is based on his performance. This is what I am going to do. Now Jesus could have said very loud and clear several things for all to hear. He could have said, no you won't. You hypocrite. When the time gets tough, you will deny me three times. You are a hypocrite like all the rest. Could he be justified in saying that? Would he say that? How does he answer him in verse 38? Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? If it was me, as soon as he said that, I know what I'd be thinking. You bet. <laughs> just, just bring him on. You, you beside me? No problems? I'll lie about that. You just give me a sword. See what I can do with a sword. Isn't that human nature? But Christ doesn't finish. Very, very say unto thee, the, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me. Yeah. How many times? <coughs> Three times. Don't forget, they're in the room. Everybody is listening. Christ has just told them that they are known because they love one another. And in their mind, they're, they're acknowledging, we are, too, we are far from that implication. <laughs> And we are too far from the application. And we're looking at Peter. Peter is... Who is Peter? He is the big fisherman. He is the one with the big mouth. He is the one that leads. He is the one that in Luke 22, Christ said to him, When you are converted, strengthen your brethren. That implication for Peter must have been, What? You mean, I'm not converted yet? Remember when I am converted. This is happening. If you were looking at the scene, if you were privy to what was going on in that room, and the next few days, who would you say would be saved? Who out of all of them would you say would be saved? Probably John, is he? Yep. Yes, it's a rhetorical, we'll just put it there. And then when you're thinking about who you think would be saved, put what Igor said. God in front of you and look at it through his eyes. 
Who would be saved? Well, the followers are there looking at Christ thinking, we are short of what you're saying. We do not love one another the way you're saying we should love one another. We want to be first. We are not servants. And Peter, he is dumbfounded. He is standing before his friend. He is standing before his saviour. And all of a sudden he realises that he is naked in his religious experience. You mean, that's, that's not it? <coughs> Even with what I've done, or what I will do, that, that's a silver and deny you? I, 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 can't, I can't stop this? Why would I deny you? You can almost see the colours in his cheeks. And if you were Peter, would you stand there confused and say, well, Lord, I followed you in the past. I know what you have done. I can see what you have done. Um, I am willing to do this in the future for you. Surely that proves that, that I'm one of your followers. Surely that proves that, that I'm deserving to be called one of your followers. I will follow you to the end. Just give me a sword and I'll show it to you. As he stands there, he comes to the realization, like all of them, that Jesus has shown them that your value system has failed you. It has exposed who you are. Can you see that? They are depending on themselves. They are trying to be first. Peter is saying, I will, I will, whatever you tell me, I will do. But they have not come to the realization until now that their system is a system of mistrust, is a system of doubt, is a system of manipulation, it's a system of anger, it's fear, it's depression, it's worthlessness, it's emptiness, it's guilt, it's insecurity. And as they're standing there and you're looking, listening to the words, how do you feel? Has, have you been uplifted listening to those words and knowing that you're in that kingdom? Has that uplifted you? John 13, verse 28, has that uplifted you when you've gotten to that point? It's my understanding that the Bible does not have chapter and verses divided. So from 38, go straight to 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Were they troubled by what they saw in themselves? Were they troubled with what Christ told Peter? And Christ is telling him, don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. To the one who was going to betray him three times, he says this. To the ones that were fighting against each other, he said this. To the ones that would desert him, he said this. They lived with him for over three years and they didn't get it. They have been with Christ but not in Christ. And to the universe, Christ is saying, this is a different kingdom. God's value system is a different kingdom. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where, and that where I am, there you may be also. As they are standing there speechless about what Christ has told them about betraying him. He comes out with this promise. What's the promise? I'm coming back for you. My father is accepting you into his house. Regardless of what you look, you're looking at yourself. Regardless of what you see. The kingdom you, that you are in is totally foreign to me. Does that make sense? Yes? Once they understood this, no wonder they changed the world. When Peter looked up at Christ and had denied him three times, what did he see in Christ's face? And all that says that what that he saw in his face, what? No condemnation. And the Bible tells us that, that, that Peter remembered his denial and went and wept. Why did he weep? Was it just the denial? 
Well, there's also the promise that he was accepted in the beloved. That my grace is sufficient for you. I am coming back for you, Peter. Christ is telling him that I am coming back for you. I have not finished with you. I am not wiping my hands off you. I am not wiping my hands off my people. I am coming back. Be patient. And after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now, if you've been asleep, now's the time to wake up. Now's the time to wake up. If you were looking at the Passover, who would you say? With your eyes, who would you say would be saved? And what are you basing that decision on? Are you basing it on the works? Are you basing it, basing it on what's visible? Or you can base it on this Christ's face that they would change. And that's the way we need to look at it. Through God's eyes. The hardest thing for me to come to to a point has been, I shared this with Igor the other day, that my prayer is not that I see people the way God sees people. I want to see God, I want to see people the way God sees me. Because I know what I am like. I know what's in my hidden heart. How does he see me? I want to see people that way. So God will come for the repentant liars, for the repentant murderers, for the repentant adulterers, for the repentant homosexuals, for the repentant cheats, for the repentant thieves. He will come to save and he hasn't changed his mind. His kingdom is not of this world and operates in a totally different number, different manner than we operate. And we have been trained to operate in this world. So because I have been trained to look at things the way Saint would like me to look at, I can look at my life and I can see my shortcomings, I can see my lies, I can see my deceit, I can see my hypocrisy, I can see my own self-righteousness, and I am troubled. I am troubled. Let not your heart be troubled, Edward. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And Edward, I go and prepare a place for you. Why? Because where I am, I want you to be. To me, that leaves me speechless. It leaves me in awe of how God can accept me that way, knowing what I'm like. And he sees humanity and says, I'm coming back. I haven't given up on you. I haven't washed my hands off you. I've given my son for you. To me, that's the true character of God. Amen. That's his character. Expressed through his son to me. Thank you for letting me share that with you. Would you like to pray? Sure. that we can come into you, come to you in the stillness, speak to our hearts. Lord, speaking to those areas of our life where Satan is still trying to convince us uh, that we are unworthy, that you wouldn't love us, that you wouldn't care for us, that causes us to utter those words, I'm never going to make it. You are 
the God who says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Mm -hmm. In that very place, in the very place where we feel that it's pointless, at that very place, God's grace, your grace is more abundantly available to us if we set you before us, if we set you before us as a God of love that is revealed in the Scriptures. Father, we pray that we would open our heart to the reality of your character, mm -hmm. that sin would cease in our lives. It's only when we know you are right that we can follow you are right. And I just pray you would bless us through the rest of the Sabbath hours. May our minds be turned to spiritual things as we fellowship together and mm -hmm. as we enter into the meeting this afternoon that you would be with us. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.